Okay. Well, thank you all for joining us. We're so, so happy to have you all here. What a wonderful crowd. Um, uh, this is our 13th first Friday on Zoom or online. It's, we have some first Fridays on Vimeo, YouTube, Facebook, and on Zoom, many of them on Zoom. And who knew a year ago that we would be doing this still today. But as Marie Harris, our, our guest host just mentioned, it's kind of nice to be able to have so many friendly faces together in such an intimate, um, an intimate place where we can all uh, see each other and chat uh, upfront and personal. Uh, we will go back to live eventually, but I think we'll probably keep the Zoom um, as an option because it's reaching so many more people that couldn't attend the live events. So um, let me first introduce the key players here. We have, uh, of course, our, our, our guest host, who is Marie Harris, the uh, former Poet Laureate of New Hampshire. Um, our Literary Arts Guild, who has put this program together and does so much during the year with so many literary events and publications. Uh, in, the, in the chairs of that, uh, Diana Lee Veely, who will be uh, co-hosting this program with us. And um, there's so many others here, but thank you all for everything that you do. And our interpreter, we're thrilled to have tonight. Uh, the first time that we have had an ASL interpreter for any of our programs, Reed Cotton is here. Um, I hope that you see her in the center of your screen. As we move on in the program to speakers and readings, I will change the gallery view to a speaker view. Actually, you can each do that yourselves. So if you want the speaker view, I believe you can each change that setting on your own computer. If you want the speaker view, you can change it to that or, or gallery. Uh, for the recording, I will be switching to the speaker view. Um, and I believe that's it. I'm going to pass this over to our uh, Literary Arts Guild co-chair. Um, I'm sorry, um, Diana Lee, will you take it for us from there? Jean, <laughs> it's an odd name. Everybody has a problem with it. Oops. I was named after my father's fishing boat. Anyway, it's an honor and a pleasure to welcome Marie Harris here. This is our 11th Whoops, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I, I have to apologize. I'm trying to uh, make the spotlights, add a spotlight. There we go. Now we have everyone there. Okay. Diana Lee? Start again. Yes. Hi, it's a pleasure to and an honor to welcome Marie Harris to our 11th annual poetry contest at the Literary Arts Guild Sponsors under CFA, Center for the Arts. You all know what that means, right? Um, Marie has been wonderful as a judge for our contest where we've worked on the theme, Native American diversity is beautiful. And we've worked in conjunction with the Kearsarge Indian Museum, Kearsarge Mountain Indian Museum. Marie has been a former poet laureate of New Hampshire from 1999 to 2004. She's a writer, a teacher, and an editor. In 2003, she gathered the, all the poet laureates from different states together, but that was a first. She served as writer in residence to many schools, high schools and grammar schools in the state. Uh, she has five books of poetry out. Desire Lines is the latest one and I devoured it when I read it. So I highly recommend it. And she also has children's books out. Um, G is for Granite, a New Hampshire alphabet book. Primary Numbers, a New Hampshire Numbers book, and The Girl Who Heard Colors, a picture book. And her book, Desire Lines, is part of the Hobblebush Books Granite State Poetry Series. Uh, but we welcome Marie, and I ask you when the poets read their poems, and Marie will read her poems after, and have a question and answer period, I ask you please to mute, because you never know, telephones ring, the noises. Including mine. <laughs> <laughs> that that wasn't planned. 
<laughs> but anyway, I'm going to get pass it on to you, Marie, so you can introduce the poems of the winners. Thank you so much, Marie. Um, let me ask you, uh, uh, Diana Lee, just a quick question. Um, do you think it would make uh, sense for the third place, second place, first place uh, winners to read their work before I say anything? Um, rather than my talking about the work before everybody hears it. I, would, I think it would be kind sure, of- I think that would be, I think that would be a great idea. Yeah, so the, uh, the first is, is the writer who wrote the ode to the Pheasant Lake High Trail. And if, if she's if willing, you, uh, it would be fun to have give, her read that. If then, you could give me the person's name because I have to spotlight them on the screen. Diana Lee, that's up to you. Deborah Lamson Perkins. Okay, I'm sorry to, uh, this is a little bit clunky here because we haven't done this before. Uh, I am not seeing her because we have to spotlight each person. Deborah Perkins, is that right? Is it Deborah Perkins? Deborah Lamson Perkins. Okay, yes. I believe this is the person. Am I right? There we go. Okay, there we go. go. Yep. And, uh, Can you hear yep. me? You're a little bit faint, Deborah. Could you could you put your uh, microphone up a bit, maybe? Say something. Is that better? No. Okay, I must not know where to look. On your computer, you might be able to 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 jack up the uh, audio. <laughs> This is the only drawback with oh, yeah. <laughs> Zoom performances, but we're all uh, used to this by now. So take your time and. Let's see, I've, I've got a speaker here. I found on my. my um... Yeah, I mean, your audio is coming through, but I'll tell you what, Deborah, if you don't mind, I'll read it for you. Okay, go ahead. I'd yeah, because I'd like the audience to hear the work before I say something. I think it makes. Well, thank you for doing that. <laughs> okay, so here's her poem. And this is the this is what I chose as the as the third place um, winner. It's called Ode to the Pleasant Lake High Trail. They were here but yesterday. Those who identified the springs, marked the watercourses, moved the rocks, built the walls, strung the twisted wire fencing, tilled the soil planted the apple trees, lilies, and laid their loved ones to rest. Now we come, latter-day pioneers creating paths of discovery, placing large flat-sided rocks in enchanted wet spaces, building rugged footbridges over streams. We identify stones, trees, lichens, fungi, animals, and birds. We marvel as we find etched in rocks, initials, dates, and drill holes, iron pins and bolts set in stone, old blaze scarred trees marking county, town, and private property boundaries. We come to consider this quiet drama. We sit upon thick mossy ledges drinking water from plastic bottles as our gaze follows distant ridgelines of lofty peaks in awe, we look down into peaceful ponds. In the stillness, our forefathers gently nudge our shoulders, and for a moment, we are together in mutual respect and appreciation for the miracle of this place. So, very nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things that I thought was a thread that ran through the three poems that I chose as, as the winning poems was something that I would call ghosts. And in this case, um, I, 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 wasn't, um, I, I wasn't aware at the beginning when I read these poems that there had been a prompt. And so obviously it began to become clear to me after I read all the poems that, that uh, that the indigenous uh, people's thread had was running through it. But the interesting thing to me about this poem is that it was the ghosts of the indigenous people that, um, that lived here um, in between the lines. Um, so she, Deborah, is talking really about, about the settlers um, 
and really without any mm, specific reference to the um, indigenous people who went before, but you know, ha has given a kind of um, nod to them in between the lines. And I think that's, that's what I liked so much about this um, poem is it was kind of, it, it, as Emily Dickinson said, Dickinson said, tell the truth, but tell it slant. It was, it's, it's sort of a slant way into um, looking at, at this landscape and acknowledging the people who made it what we know it as now, a made landscape, as opposed to a landscape that our indigenous forebears um, experienced and, and did not change, really. Um, so uh, we can, after the Q&A, we could talk a bit about uh, wh what that is. I'm not even sure, and, and in the Q&A, we can ask Deborah whether or not that was on her mind, but that's what I took away from it. And so that's, that's what I have to say about that poem. Uh, thank you. Thank you for reading and thank you, Deborah. Wonderful poem. Um, who, who would be the next person, um, Marie, that I, I have to find them in our, in our gallery view here? Diana Lee. Who, who is the second place Allison winner? Bishop. Say that again, please. Allison Bishop. Bishop. Allison. Okay, here we come, Allison. We're coming, coming for you. <laughs> uh, oh, Allison, I believe, I believe I have you. Am I right? Hold on just a minute, please. Okay, Allison, thank you for being here. You have to unmute yourself. You have to, uh, yeah, yeah. There you go. Hi everyone, thanks for coming. Um, thanks for organizing this. We're delighted to do so. Beg your pardon? I said we're delighted to do so and to have you oh, here. Congratulations. Yeah. Would you would you like to read your poem or would you? Yeah, like I was okay. I was just about to. Okay. Yeah, would you like me to read it? Yes, please. called Elder. I am so old my patience fondles a future already made. I am old enough to remember how to seek food with my drum and to ask butterfly of future seasons. I remember that my senses feel colors that are extinct and that my skin breathes all time equally and seeks it here. I am old enough to call the rocks family, the mountains teacher. When I sit near a tilted line of water, I know it is me. To become old, one befriends rocks, consults mountains, honors, water. One learns to stand on the divided island some call life and soak peace from sky and land. I am old enough to know I am a bystander to the ripples of insect births and star deaths. I should be eroded by the shallow crimes of hate in human history, but I am old enough to see that our future sings of a tail swallowed by a mouth as it devours its past. And I am at peace watching the feast, awed by its appetite. I am so old, this makes me new. Wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, wonderful. 
And you read it so well. You read it so well. That that's uh, 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 that's part of the pleasure, isn't it? You know, and and when when those when these poems are read out loud, um, the the sorts of things that you might miss on the page, the the internal rhymes and the kind of assonance of of some of the of the words and stuff comes out in the in the voice, and and you're good at that. You're a good reader. <laughs> The thing that, that um, pulled me in about this poem, first of all, um, I found it androgynous. We have no idea whether the speaker is male or female, and I liked that. Um, um, it also uh, kind of keyed into my notion that, that the poems that I like best in, in, this, in this collection of, of wonderful poems that I got to read is that we still have this, this kind of feeling of a ghost. Um, uh, I wrote that um, to myself that you have, you the poet have inhabited the spirit of an indigenous person, male or female. Um, and I, I think that's so interesting that you, you let that happen. Um, and it's, it's the spirit of a, of a person from a, a really long disappeared past um, and a voice of a uh, kind of universal voice of, 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 of the elder, the whole notion that the elder holds the past and the secrets and the, and the possibilities um, is, is in this poem. And in a sense, it's both an elegy for time lost and a, a kind of a prayer for the future. And so I'm, I'm thinking about uh, phrases like, um, well, first of all, when we go back to the, you know, to the, to the who this elder is, I'm old enough to remember how it, how to seek food with my drum. That's so cool. Uh, ask the butterfly of future seasons. What, what a wonderful line. Old enough to call the rocks family and the mountain teacher. So all of this kind of pulls us into the value and, and, and importance of, of, uh, of an indigenous past. Um, um, but, and then you say, I should be eroded by the shallow crimes of hate in human history, um, acknowledging what happened, but at the same time, deciding that it would not, it would not uh, suck the, 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 the importance out of it, out of the, uh, um, uh, out of the history. And our future sings of a tale swallowed by its mouth as it devours its past. I'm at peace. And that's where, that's where I loved the way this poem ends is that this elder is saying, despite all of the um, difficulties and, and depredations, um, I'm at peace. I'm so old, this makes me new. I mean, it's a very hopeful, hopeful poem. And I think that's what I loved best about it. So again, in, in the Q and A, we'll probably chat about that too. You are about to say something, what? I, I just wanted to say that I just I, I just remembered that when I wrote this poem, uh, I was actually thinking of indigenous elders from around the world and not just North America. It's it's about uh, that whole culture of people. So um, I just wanted to sort of elaborate that idea too that it, we might think indigenous as local, but we lost indigenous in Europe and we lost indigenous, I mean, we lost indigenous everywhere. So I think that was part of the spirit of this poem too. I think it comes through. Um, and, and again, it's because you haven't pinned it down uh, um, whether by um, gender or by place, you've made it um, you know, much more universal. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, Thank excellent. You. Wonderful. Really excellent. Wonderful. Um, and who, who is our ne next guest that I could have on the screen here? It is Jenny Pollard. Okay, bear with me a moment while I find Jenny. Uh, oh, I just found her. There you are. No, I'm sorry. Hmm. Jenny Pollard, I'm coming for you. <laughs> I promise. I know you're here. I must have just gone right up. 
There you are, of course. There you are. Thank you, Jenny, for bearing with me there. You can unmute, please. Okay. <laughs> Here I am. Would, would you like to read your poem or would you like it to be read for you? I'll read it. Okay, great. Thank you. Adobe walls. I rode my horse bareback along the dry wash. Cottonwood trees showed the path through the hungry desert. I felt the heat of my horse pass into me. The breeze scratched against my face. I traveled to an adobe village long abandoned where walls spoke to me of people's lives. I heard voices echo in the dried mud. It was a secret place, no visible road or markers. I would slide off my horse and peer into the past, imagining a family warming themselves by the cook fire, harvesting their three sisters, the seeds saved over thousands of years. Did the Anastasi suddenly appear in Arizona? I felt their suffering in the saguaros who witnessed their passage and hope in the cactus's impossible flowers of spring. These are the original peoples of the Americas. I see them in the clear sky and vast expanses like a mirage. I see them where memories are stored behind silent eyes, ancient and wise and mysterious. They are heritage as well as history. These Native American footprints are our legacy. Very nice. Again, <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Marie? Well, you know, I also have to say that it was very difficult to make these choices because the work, there was so much resonance in so many of the poems, all of the poems really, and, and so many wonderful lines and, and uh, but, um, you know, I, I chose what I chose um, and the way, you, you know, I, you know I, I just think that any judge of these sorts of things is really just saying, you know, what resonates with me I'm different from somebody else, some other judge who might have some other um, uh, point of view. So um, you have to take it with a grain of salt. The thing, one of the things that, that, that resonated with me with this one was that I have recently, semi-recently been um, to Mesa Verde um, where these um, uh, Anasazi homes carved out of the, out of the uh, canyon walls were. And so, you know, I went, oh yeah, I've been there. I, I get it, you know. Um, but, you know, I don't know whether you rode your horse along the dry wash, but I believed it. Did you? Good. I did. <laughs> I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> but even if you didn't, you know, I, I believe that you, you inhabited um, this place. I think that there's such a sense here of place. And um, of course, um, from what I know, um, Indigenous peoples all over the world, as, as Allison said, you know, um, have many, 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 many things in common. And of course, one of them is place. One of them is, 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 the, is the land. And you, you evoked that for me so well. Um, and I loved your language. I felt the heat of my horse pass into me. The breeze scratched against my face. That's such a, I mean, a breeze in that in environment is scratchy. <laughs> You know, I mean, I, it was it was a well chosen uh, uh, word, and um, and then you know you're into the village, whether you are really or whether you are in your imagination doesn't matter, um, and the voices are are echoing in the dried mud. It felt for me anyway, and I think for you like a secret place, and and it was, you know, it was in those days. It was not some place that people other people came to. Um, and so the cook fires and, and the three sisters, what is that, corn, beans, and what's the third one? Squash. Squash. Corn, right. beans, and squash. I was going to say melon, but yeah, same thing. Um, and just all of it was very visceral, very immediate. Um, and 
you know, I believed that you, as much as possible, were able to inhabit uh, that world. And again, I've got to say again, ghosts, I mean, ghosts have threaded almost all the poems that I read from, from this, this collection that, that I was given. Um, and these are ghosts there. It, it's like, you know, as you say, I see them like a mirage, um, ancient and wise. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I guess all I have to say is that, that I, um, I was there with your words. And um, I think that you evoked um, the, that world wonderfully. And again, like the other poets, you brought it, um, you know, brought it home, brought it here. Their heritage as well as history, their footprints are our legacy. You know, you, so that, you know, that was brought home too, just like um, ha happened in, um, in Allison's poem as well. So that's, that's my two cents. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Very honored. Thank you. Congratulations. Anne Marie, will you read your poems? Oh, I would, yes. I think I put them aside. Well, what I decided to do um, was to, to, to find three poems that, in a, oh, for heaven's sake, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Let me just mute myself somehow. Or my husband will. No, oh, he did. <laughs> <laughs> Why, where's my mute button, damn it? <laughs> Uh, I'm so funny with these screens, you sort of see this and that and then something obscures something else and whatever. So sorry about the phone. Um, when I was asked to read a couple of poems tonight, I decided to try to, to pick three poems that had some relationship with the three poems that I, that I chose as the winners. And so um, the first one is called New Year, New Hampshire. And I wrote this poem, and so this is in, in kind of semi-response to Deborah's poem um, that has to do with the settlers and people who, you know, who uh, white, white, white colonial uh, New Hampshire settlers. It's, it's got some echoes of that. And I wrote this poem when I was Poet Laureate. And um, I don't know whether any of you remember Van McLeod. He was a wonderful man. Um, who died a couple of years ago. He was the uh, Commissioner of Cultural Resources. And um, in that role, he, he helped all of, all of us artists in all fields to um, be our best and to contribute to New Hampshire's art scene. And when I became Poet Laureate, Van said to me, well, you've got, you've got a job to do. And of course, this job doesn't come with any money or any job description. The, the, the poet laureate job. Uh, so Van, Van took it upon himself to tell me what I had to do. And what he, one of the things that he told me I had to do was to write uh, a poems uh, for occasions, um, particularly inauguration. So the first one I wrote was for Jean Shaheen's, I think it was third inauguration as governor of New Hampshire. And I did it with great pleasure, had a wonderful time, you know, thinking up the poem and, and, and read it at her swearing in. And then the next two years or whatever it was, um, Craig Benson was elected uh, governor of New Hampshire. I couldn't stand Craig Benson. And I, had, I had no connection with his policies or his point of view or anything. And, and I said, Van, you can't, no, I can't do this. And he said, you are not writing a poem for Craig Benson. You are writing a poem on the occasion of. I went, all right, okay. So, I actually end up, ended up liking this poem that I wrote better, or I thought it was a better poem uh, than the one that I wrote for Jean. Um, maybe it was the crucible effect. Anyway, the poem is called New Year, New Hampshire, and it starts with a quote from John Adams that says, how few have ever had anything more of a choice in government than in climate, or how lucky we are. That's me, not him. 
Okay, so here's the poem. The hunger moon draws icy tides upriver, heaving gray-green slabs of seawater onto the salt marshes. Inland, a house rides snow swells into evening while inside the householder, satisfied in the knowledge of a well-provisioned root cellar, a woodshed stacked with even cords, pulls the shutters to, turns from the darkening window. And still quarrelsome winds bay down the chimney. The urge to retreat to hearth and leather bound studies of certainty is as strong as the pull of the moon. But there are times when what we need most are the rude and raucous disputations that sputter and spark like bonfires on frozen ponds, attracting a quorum of neighbors. So that's kind of what I chose to echo Deborah's poem about um, Pleasant Lake. Very nice. The second one that I'll read, um, I was also commissioned to write, um, but it was, a, it was a competition that my wonderful friend, Emil Birch, the sculptor who's got amazing public sculptures all over New Hampshire, asked me to collaborate uh, with, because the Sunapee Park, 50th anniversary, there was, there was a, a competition to create a work of art that would commemorate their 50th anniversary. And it had to, um, it had to talk about uh, Sunapee State Park's um, natural beauty and its role as a recreation uh, place and, and, and its history and all that sort of stuff. And, and um, uh, Emil created a sculpture uh, and he, he wanted words from me and it was the first time that I'd ever had to write a poem with engineering specifications. The lines could only be so long, given the space. The letters had to be so high in order to be readable. And so th that determined the length of the line. Um, and I had to come up with a poem that uh, echoed the flora, the fauna, the history that, I mean, it was just whatever. So I wrote this poem um, that is now inscribed when you say, you know, my, my words are written in stone. Well, they are uh, up at Sunapi on his sculpture. And this poem is called Sunapi Mandala. And it, um, it kind of uh, made me, I did this because of um, Allison's poem um, about elder and about the past and about history and some somehow trying to pull it all together. So it's a very short poem. Sunapi Mandela. Leave your shadow here on the long memory of rock that you may number among the friends of the planet. We are one in summer woods overflowing with wings, in the fires kindled by orange lily struck against fern flint, one with the music of wind played on icy birch bones and the promise pollen spells across the watery mirrors of our future. Lovely. Thanks. And the last one um, that I'll read is, is a, you know, a kind of a, I don't know, um, echo in some way of adobe walls. Um, um, again, and I, I picked poems that, that happened to me because I was laureate and I was asked to do this, these different things. And um, there were two initiatives in Rochester, New Hampshire, at least two, but two that I was involved in, that involved public art in the streets. And the first one was so fun. This, uh, you know, Rochester, of course, used to be a, a shoe factory town. And so the first public art project had to do with the shoes of Rochester. And it was like one huge, I mean, like enormous six foot at least um, model of a shoe that was um, sculpted into a cowboy boot, a, a roller skate, a um, work boot, all these shoes. So uh, the, 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 the template was, was given to artists 
to decorate. And then it was also given to poets to write on and, or you know, make, make some kind of word association. Totally cool. The second one was, um, the theme was called, If These Stones Could Talk. And there were all kinds of sculptures that were um, placed all over the city of Rochester and in one way or the other um, had to do with stones and granite and history and all this sort of stuff. Well, the one that I was asked to respond to was done by Diane and Ron St. Jean. And it was a, it was a plexiglass sort of skinny box on top of a, a plinth. And within that box were um, all kinds of different stones. And I looked at them all and I said to myself, these are a history of our place going back and back and back and forward and forward and forward. And so this is the poem I wrote. And by the way, there's a couple of words here that you might not know. I love words that we don't know and then you can just, just look, look them up for heaven's sake. One of them is tombolo. And, and tombolo is a kind of, um, mess of rocks all, all sort of together. And another one is, um, da, 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 maybe that's the only one. Yeah, I think that's the only one. Okay, so here's the, here's the poem and, and you, wanna, you wanna pretend that you're looking at a whole bunch of rocks and in, e in each one you're seeing part of this region's history. It's called Stones, a History. Glacier, retreating. Notches, clawed. Low coastal hills, beating sea, glacial till. A tumbolo of sand and rocks, tumbled. New land, dreamland, rising. Above high water, hot summer stones for Piscataqua to dry fish. Striated stones under the boots of tall ship sailors. Flattened stones for Sunday skipping. Among stones, the purple mussel wampum shell, sea glass, rum and medicine and Coke bottles, old car blinkers, twists of polypropylene, plastics, like beached jellyfish. Thanks. That was wonderful. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, would is it? Would you like Diana Lee to say anything at this point, or Marie, uh, before we open things up? Well, I'd just like to thank the readers, the poets, and thank Marie. And what an extra special occasion was to have joy to have Reed do the signing. Wonderful. I think that added a tremendous new dimension to this program. So thank you, Jean, for arranging that. Sorry, my my pleasure. Sorry I, I had you off the screen there for a little bit. Um, yes, I, I I love um hearing the words right from the poets themselves, but it's also beautiful to see it interpreted. It's wonderful. It's a whole new dimension. Um, let me go back to the full screen, if that would be okay with everyone here. Uh, I may be, let me see what we can do. There we go. Gallery view. I hope everyone is here who was here before. I hope I didn't leave anyone out. Um, this has been wonderful. Um, Diana Lee, would you like to, or Marie, um, introduce the Q&A or, or, and I will just watch for people as they raise their hand. If you could unmute and then we will have one at a time. I think that will be the best scenario. Is there anybody? Okay, I can see who, are you able to see who has a question? Uh, for those people that I can see their, have their video on, I can see them if you raise your hand. I can't see those that have their names only. So you will have to tell me in the chat, I guess, if you have a question. Actually, uh, Anna Glavis said they're beautiful poems. Thank you for sharing. Uh, I believe she had to leave and she's going to hear the rest of it on the recording. 
And Wally Borgen uh, says, for the winners, how did you begin to write these beautiful poems? What was the process? Would any of the winners like to uh, dive in there and tell us what was it like to write these from scratch? Uh, Allison, Jenny. Hi. Um... I have two processes when I write a poem. One of them is that there's an emotion that I want to express, but it often comes out uh, in a surprising way. And the other is that a poem comes usually while I'm out walking. And, um, and I want to say it spills. I don't construct it. And often the ones that spill are the ones that are the poems I like the most. And I found four versions of this one in my computer. And the first one was definitely the best one and is the one that I submitted. Uh, but I, I wrote this quite some time ago, so I don't have a, a recent process to share with you, but that's, that's usually it. It's a walk and then it's, and then it's, uh, and then something something comes, it's beckoned and then it, <laughs> that's, that's how it works for me, if it works at all. Thank you, uh, Deborah or Jenny, just unmute. Um, this is Jenny. Um, I really enjoy stories and I like to think about the people um, who might have lived somewhere or done something. Um, and, and that's the way my poems start with the, the people and maybe the nature of surrounding them, you know, the, where they lived or, or what they did. Thank you. Uh, Deborah, do you have anything to add to that? I would like to, if you can hear me. Just speak loudly. <laughs> okay. Um, I love the comments you made about my poem, and it's true. I wrote this poem in 2006 after I had done this high trail. I was just overwhelmed with the emotions of the space. And you're right. It, it, I was just considering the generations who had actually um, uh, colonized the area. But I think in my last paragraph, I, I uh, gave um, credit to anyone and everyone of all generations going way back to the, to our, for, to our uh, Native Americans, that we all shared this space at one time, and we all found it amazing and a miracle, miraculous space. So I, I think in the last paragraph, I um, fulfilled the mission of this, <laughs> of the poetry. Uh -huh. Thank you. This um, has been an interesting experience. <laughs> and I appreciate it so much. Marie, would you like to add about, or Diana Lee or other poets here, what is your creative inspiration and how do poems flow from you? Is it the same every time or different every time? Marie, you want to go first? No, you go first. <laughs> well, for me, it's, I, poetry to me is always trying to capture it. I think Allison said this, it's to capture an emotion. I have, I see a robin in the yard building a nest and some days that becomes a poem. Other days, I see the Lone Ranger on television and that just became a television, that became a poem. Um, I never know what's gonna spark my imagination, but it's always an emotion that I feel towards something. And then the poem just flows from there. Yeah, I'd agree. Um, it's kind of a combination. I, I, I've always been a voracious reader. And so some, sometimes things trigger um, poems because I read something and then that connects with something that's happening in my life or ha happening out in the world and and sort of one thing leads to another. I'm, uh, I'm loath to say what actually sparks poems. I don't really believe in inspiration. <laughs> I think it's really, um, it's a craft that you work at. And um, I think for me, 
poetry is a way of trying to translate the world um, that that I live in, um, and that could be the you know difficult political outside world. It could be family. It could be um, something that's completely um, divorced from human agency. You know, just I write poems about birds a lot. Um, so really, I think it's just sort of like keeping your eyes and ears open. And, and then one, th one thing to me connects with another. Sometimes I'll be writing a poem about a bird, and a particular, because I'm kind of a fanatic amateur birder. Um, and, and that will then jump me off into, into thinking about my childhood or, or jump me off into thinking about some political reality that's happening. And it just, it's all, to me, it's all kind of connections. Um, and they all begin with just noticing, I think really, just noticing. I love when that happens, Marie. I love when the poem takes its own direction. Yeah. Start out writing about a bird or the Lone Ranger and then the poem just goes where it wants to go. Yeah. Yeah, and you think, wow. Yeah, how did that happen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, are are there any other poets in the group? I know there are who would like to add to that creative process. Maybe Catherine O'Brien might have something to say. Catherine or, oops, um, oh there we are, Catherine. I don't see your video, but I do have you on the screen if you'd like to speak to that or just unmute. Let me unmute and can you hear me? We can. Yes. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, sorry, I had a husband and a dog. <laughs> um, I guess poems begin in lots of different ways and uh, inspiration can come from a place to me or a vision. Uh, it can start with a line from another poem that I find incredible. And uh, I just loved so many of the poems read tonight. And, uh, Marie, you're an incredible poet laureate. <laughs> you did a fabulous job. So I think also it's kind of mysterious how a poem begins. So um, it can just be something deep inside you that you respond to. There's a lot of attention right now being given to writing prompts. I just noticed lots of people using them and teaching and to get you going on a poem. So that's one way people can start a poem from an idea. Um, that's not usually how I get started. So that's about it for me. I just wanted to say, I love the interpretation the ASL was fantastic just amazing i kept trying to see how did you interpret the word indigenous and what i wanted to see that again and again and he's doing I have, it now well, i have some questions for you how do you sign poetry do you prepare and have to do research in any special way Unmute to respond. Joan um, Doran, do you want to answer that? Uh, read. read. I, I read them. I read them several times. I, and then I read them backwards. You know, to give me the. Vision. What am I to answer? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Joan. Hold on just a second, please. Okay. We're just li listening to Reed tell how she. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, how she decides how to interpret. Of course, interpretation is set. <laughs> there are words for for every. There are signs for words, but they can be interpreted in slightly different ways, which make them beautiful. Um. So, how, so the indigenous sign again, Reed. Indigenous. And poetry is like. So it's really the people of the land. So, ah. and it comes from the idea that 
they are in this land, right? So it's the indigenous, and they're from all over the world. It's a sign that's used to mean indigenous of from anywhere. That's amazing. Yeah. That is amazing. I mean, to have, to have two hands do this one motion that says people of the land, that's just stunning. It's poetic. I was just going to say, that's a poem. There yes. it is. Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, now, sure. let's, um, let's go on to Joan Doran, who is also a poet, to tell us a little bit about her process. Whoops. I'm sorry, Joan. I have to get you in the proper spotlight. Oh, you are spotlighted. And often. Okay. Often the way it happens with me is, again, we're talking about an emotion, something that happens that strikes you and you feel on to follow it. Um, often I find these things sort of fester or sort of simmer down underneath for a while and sometimes I'll wake up at five in the morning and it will rush out as if my myself has been uh, living with this for a little bit and uh, it, it knows what it knows its voice and it knows what it wants to say um, it's not always the case uh, but often I, I find that there is some voice there that I that wants to say what it has to say and and to follow it rather than to force it uh, later on, uh, you can go back and tweak and so forth. But as, as one of us has mentioned, often it's the first version that uh, seems to have the life. But I have also had the other experience where I would force it. And the probably uh, an intruder from another part of myself would come in and and take over, but when I reverted and let the original voice be what it wanted to, it seemed to work well. Thank you for that insight. Um, is there anyone else here who would like to say something um, to or ask a question of Marie or, um, or our winning poets? I'd like to say something. Sure, Nancy, um, Nancy, Nancy please do. Andy, Andy Bullock, the um, executive director of the Mount Kearsage Indian Museum, and his team are the ones who gave us the theme. And he's here with us, perhaps. Oh. Andy, you could say something about your response to the poet response to your theme. Uh, Andy? Mm -hmm. you just unmute, please? I'm putting him on the spot. <laughs> Oops, let me uh, get the right people. Sure. I'm here. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like to? Yep. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Nancy. I appreciate your facilitating this, and you've been a wonderful supporter of the museum over the years. Uh, this poetry program is certainly a new experience for me personally, but it really kind of spoke to me in a number of ways. Um, the museum in Warner is 30 years old now and our founder, Bud Thompson, on Monday celebrates his 99th birthday. So we're really excited about that. But all of these poems kind of made me think of one, uh, Bud has comments and sayings and slogans for everything, but one of the things he often says is, if two people think exactly alike, one of them is unnecessary. And so it really spoke to me where my understandings of a lot of these things may take a different slant and where the museum gallery has a program where we can have a third grade class come through the museum galleries and we can have a very meaningful discussion with that third grade class and 
have an experience all across North America through the seven galleries, the next group of people that might come to the museum might literally be PhD candidates. And we can have that same tour, that same conversation going through that same galleries at a different level because there is so much there to flesh out. And so that's really what I'm coming away with today. And I'm, I'm just overjoyed to be part of this program. So thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate all the input and all the uh, suggestions and work you've done for it. Um, let me see, go back to gallery. Any, anybody else? Um, uh, oh, I think Catherine, Catherine Flanagan, you unmute and then we'll go to Kathy Blow. Hi, um, I live way north of Montreal and this is the first time I've been with your group. And it's really exciting for me to be able to be part of it from such a great distance because I couldn't physically be there even if we didn't have COVID, it's a long way. But I'm a friend of Allison and she invited me and I just wanted to say, I think it's lovely and thank you. Oh, that's, that's terrific. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Kathy, I think you had something to say. Yeah. from. Um, from a songwriter point of view, I just wanted to say thank you for this program because I, I realized that I really am a poet mm -hmm. and I write my words thinking I'm going to put them to music or maybe somebody else would put them to music or I would have music and um, uh, I don't know, the word and the resonance of, of where the word should go is really interesting to me in this moment. You know, when words are written, should they be uh, spoken or sung or or read, you know, uh, there's yeah. just a big thing that's uh, that is presenting itself today to me. So I, I thank you for that inspiration. And I think from now on, I won't always think I have a song. Maybe I have a poem here and there. And I have taken other people's poems and put it to music. And so there's so much that can happen with the written word. So I thank you. Well, you have so many gifts, Kathy, to share. Is there anybody else? Oh, Sue Elliott. Yes, I was just a thank you all. They were just wonderful to hear and especially to hear about what inspires you. I find that so interesting. Um, I, I was wondering where might we find these in writing so we can have them and keep them so we can go back to them and, and read them again. Well. Sharon, you want to address that? Yes, um, I will be posting them on the website tomorrow morning. Um, so you can find them there under the um, Literary Arts Guild and then the poetry section. Thank you. Will, will they ever be published anywhere in a hard copy or? Well, if you if if you allow me to to uh, to to plug my own book, all the poems that I read <laughs> are in, in in one of the sections of Desire Lines from Hobblebush. So okay. I don't know about the other three poets, uh, but uh, well, Marie, that's, that's on my list of the next thing to to buy. Oh, good. <laughs> Marie, Marie, I'm putting that in the chat box. It's Desire Lines from. H Hobble Bush books. Hobble Bush. Okay, I'm unfamiliar with them, so I want to make sure I get that in here. Oh, it's a it's a wonderful New Hampshire-based press, and they have a series. They've got all kinds of different things that come out from that press, but they've got a series called the Granite State Poetry Series. I think my book was number thirteen. Kyle Potvin's book is next, and I think it's either just out or or about to be out. And um, it it it's a lovely. Um, overview of contemporary New Hampshire poets. So I, I recommend the whole series highly. Oh, wonderful. Is this Hobblebush Press just for poetry? Uh, no, oh. but um, well, uh, mostly. Uh-huh. Oh gosh, I have to look in my mind about their catalog, but and I do- New Hampshire based. This. Uh, yes, New Hampshire based, yes. Uh, um, Sid Hall is the, is the uh, general editor. Um, Kirsty Walker is the editor now and, and Roger Martin, but the, uh, 
I, I'm sure there's some other books in the press that are not only poetry. Just go to their go to their website. It's it's mm -hmm. a terrific press. Mm -hmm. Thank you. you. Know, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, I look I look forward to seeing these in print. Um, yeah. They're lovely, lovely to hear being read, but I do look forward to reading them again. Right. So do yeah. I. Yeah, that's always good. Um, and any other comments before we have to say goodbye? Anything else? Yeah. Well, I have to say thank you so much, um, uh, uh, Jean and, and Diana Lee, for inviting me to be a judge, which was a very interesting and, and exciting experience. And um, it also, I have never been to the to the museum in Warner, and uh, that's a big mistake. So I'll, I will be up there when it opens again. I imagine probably this later this spring or early summer. And um, I, I drive by the sign, you know, and uh, as many people might, and I just haven't ever gotten off that exit. So I will. And, and I just want to say thank you so, so much for allowing me to be part of this really exciting, vital event. Well, thank, thank you for joining thank us, you, Diana Marie. Lee. Do you have anything more to add? Just to thank, thank everybody. Without Marie, without Marie, without Jean, without the whole Literary Arts Guild behind us, and I, again, Reed just added such a great dimension to this whole series. And I'm really thrilled with the attendance and the sign. It, it all came together beautifully. Thank, thank you all. Thank you all. Congratulations to the winners. Thank you, Marie. And thank you for the Literary Arts Guild for setting this up. Um, it was a wonderful program. You can see uh, the links on our website and I wrote it in the chat box, but the, uh, the address is, for us is Center for the Arts NH.org, or the shorter version is CFANH.org. The link to this program will be there. It will be uh, on our YouTube channel, which again is Center for the Arts, Lake Sunapee Region. It's the YouTube channel. Um, and the link to the poetry will be there as well. So please uh, join us again for more First Fridays and for more literary arts events coming up soon. Thank you all and have a wonderful weekend. Um, oh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, the students. I'm so sorry. There are students who wanted to stay on and speak to read uh, after the program is uh, finished. If there are students who would like to stay on, please stay on and everyone else have a great weekend. Great, oh good, I'm glad you stayed on. I was hoping I wasn't canceling things too quickly. Can you all unmute and uh, go right ahead and, and, and talk to Reed about being an interpreter? We don't have everybody's video, but we can hear you if you unmute. Oh, there we go, great. We'd love to see you, Maddie and Myra, if you don't mind, but it's okay if you don't want to. <laughs> Hi. Um, so Reed did a beautiful job tonight. Thank you, it's our first time doing this. So we're thrilled with the way it went. And I, I hope it was uh, is a good evening for Reed as well, uh, but what, Questions do you have for Reed about what, what is your field of study? What are you doing? Why are you here? <laughs> Open it up, kids. <laughs> Jump right I in. Guess, I guess I'll go first. Um, hi, I'm Maddie. <laughs> um, so my field of study right now, I'm actually uh, in the interpreting program right now. So I'm trying to become an interpreter uh, at UNH yeah, Manchester. Where are you? <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, and so for some of the poems, oh, I'm a junior, yeah. <laughs> so close to senior year. Um, so for one of the poems, I don't know why this caught my eye out of everything, but the word jellyfish, I know sometimes for certain um, poems, like some people actually like do like the motion of what a jellyfish does. So I was just curious, like, why you fingerspelled and then said fish because <laughs> it was the last it was the last word of the poem okay 
and I felt like it, you know, the idea of a fish, no, the idea of jellyfish, I think that made it more poignant. And again, it's based on interpretation, right? I thought that made a very searing picture, a dead jellyfish versus a dead, I don't know, carp. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a very different picture. And knowing your audience too. Okay, uh, Jacob, if you would like to unmute, just jump in here with a question. Um, hi, I'm Jacob. I am also a student at UNH in the interpreting program, but actually I'm quite a far, far away from graduating. I'm a freshman, not a junior. Um, 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 you learning ASL? Does that sign me? Oh, I live in Derry. From what high school? Oh, high school, done, okay. That's okay. I'm from Pickerton Academy. It's a, oh, oh, it is, it is a little, I just wanna say it is a little bit difficult because um, with the motion, you know, the, the video isn't crisp. Uh, I was going to talk to Reed about that later to see if we could improve that with our next presentation. But sometimes where the signs are so quick, you can see my hands, they, they kind of blur a little bit. So, yeah. So, a lot of that has to do with the background. And when you have a virtual background, uh-huh. the computer system works harder to maintain that than uh-huh. it does for your signs because they take a shorter period of time to do. Whereas the virtual background takes a large portion of the energy that the computer generates. Yeah, a good point. Yeah. What I was told. Yeah. <laughs> um, Pikachu Academy. So, Jacob, were you in, were you in the ASL social in your junior, senior year of high school? Yes, I was. I was there. You saw me and my students there performing with you. Yeah. Ah. Um, You looked familiar. (laughs) What school is this? Uh, Jacob went to Pinkerton Academy, which is the high school in Derry, and they offer American Sign Language there. I teach American Sign Language in Manchester. Um, His teacher, one of his teachers, is my former student, just to show you how old it is. And I remember seeing you there. So that's why you looked familiar. That's why I was asking where you went to high school. Yeah, the positioning, yeah, I was thrown off. I'm uh, also not in the most focused setting to be doing this. Well, but you're a freshman. Cut yourself a break. You're a freshman. <laughs> Relax, you'll get there. Yeah, um, but yeah, so I had, I, I mean, I know Beth and Gail, because I actually started learning ASL as a sophomore, um, but I was involved in ASL club um, my freshman year, so that's Beth and Gail, um, then you know everything that happened. Yeah, with sure do. Um, Pomerello came in, she was my ASL one and two instructor, so it's like she was like my technical first teacher, um, and then I took both ASL three and four as a senior, um, so I had Jotham for a hundred and twenty minutes. So ago. you have seen poetic sign language. Yes. You have seen poetry put into sign language. You have seen uh, top forty American songs put into sign language. So you have already a depth, whether or not you choose to explore it. You already have a depth of understanding back here. 
Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Do, cool. do the others also here? Do the um, do the students also um, have you taken you know a ASL in your high schools? No. Okay, Maddie. Maddie, did. yes. At Pinkerton also. Okay. Oh, okay. So they so know. Do you remember my students performing in your junior and senior year? When? I mean, we've been doing this for 10, 12 years. Oh. This, we would not be even riding a bike then. <laughs> we were there 2018, 2017. We've been doing this since I think 20. The memories get so boggy. <laughs> Well, so what we used to do was we would round robin. So we would have it one year. Um, Bedford High School would have it one year since they offered sign language, um, Pinkerton. And then ultimately Pinkerton, because that school is like a college campus. It is so beautiful. That auditorium, the Stockbridge Theater. Oh my God, it's like, well, I mean, I can't compare it to anything. I mean, it's just this beautiful, comprehensive theater that's open to the community, oh, but wonderful. the school gets to use it primarily, of course. Okay. And finally, Jotham said, just let's do it here from now on. You, get, you can afford the bus to get here. Let's just do it here. So we had been doing it at Pinkerton for, I'm going to say, four years before COVID hit. Uh -huh. So we've been doing it from your alma mater for years. Uh -huh. So. Except yeah. last year. Last year. <laughs> well, we, we, we <laughs> built in a period of time where we will talk about the BC, which would be before COVID. That's right. Uh, tell me, Erica, and is it Maria Isabel? Maria Isabel, yeah. Yeah, beautiful name. Give us your, your background and, and ask Reed some questions. Um, so I'm a sophomore at UNH Manchester. Um, I'm studying to become ASL English interpreter. Um, and Ms. Schaefer, uh, Lori Schaefer is my um, intro to interpretation professor. Lori Schaefer. Um, Lori Schaefer is your, your intro. Schaefer, yes. Because yes. uh, oh. Donna Schaefer is at UNH Durham. Oh, and okay. She also teaches uh, ASL there. Oh, okay. Um, so my question for you is: um, so you were mentioning someone actually asked you um, in, when we were all as a group um, how you prepare, and that was my question for you as well. So you mentioned that you read backwards the poem. Well, I read it forwards. Yeah, I read it forwards, and then when I start to put it together, I read it backwards. Hmm. Um, do you do anything else to uh, anything else to prepare it, it this one specifically was for poetry but um like in general I do a lot so if it's songs because it has a limited time frame I do a lot more work hmm. but poetry because it has a form it doesn't have restrictions of a form other than the words um I I have a lot more flexibility, mm -hmm. you know, and my goal is to try and end at the same time the poet ends. Ah, that's mm -hmm. different. <laughs> that does oh, work that sometimes. Time. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, well, you did a beautiful job. Mar Mar Maria Isabel, what have you oh. got? Hi, I'm Maria Isabel. Um, I'm a junior at UNH in Manchester, but also in Durham. So I kind of, um, I do both. So I'm a Durham student technically, but I do do the major in ASL. Um, Did you take classes with Donna Schaefer before you decided no, to go to Manchester? So, oh. um, yeah, because I taught, I, um, the classes here are actually really hard to get into. Um, in, in Durham, in I Durham, know. Yeah, oh, Durham, wait Durham. list, I know. You think it was, you know, Johnny Depp doing a stage reading or something. I know, yeah. I know, it's ridiculous. It's mostly, it's mostly juniors and seniors that are in those classes anyway. So, um, but, so I'm doing that, um, but I'm also a psychology student um, in Durham. So I, I, I do both majors. Um, but um, I don't know, I feel like all the questions I've had were already asked. So like, 
I, I can't really think of anything right now, at least. <laughs> well, can I ask you some questions then, all of you? Uh, let's talk about deaf poets. How many of you have watched Ian Sanborn? Okay, homework assignment. <laughs> Go on Google or YouTube and find Ian Sanborn doing the caterpillar. Or no, the butter, no, the caterpillar. It's actually pretty cool because pretty cool. <laughs> no, I was gonna say it's uh it's um what's the word? Not it's coincidental that you bring him up because um earlier this semester, uh, in my sign language class. Uh, when we were doing like guest presentations and guest speakers, Ian Sanborn was actually my group's uh, speaker that we asked questions to. Oh, oh you, got to, you got to chat with him, did you? Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Wonderful. Yeah. Great, okay, another great poet. How many of you have seen poetry done by Stephanie Hockelin? Okay. Nigel Howard. Hold it. I'm writing these down. Oh. Uh, in, I'm writing them in the chat so that other people might see them. Okay. Uh, these are wonderful deaf poets, correct? Just some. I mean, there's there's tons. I'm just, there, I, I have to say, I have to be honest, some deaf poets, I love the way they do the work. I don't necessarily love the work. I love the way they present it. Okay. You know, Rosalie Tim. Rosa Lee Tim. Lee Tim. Phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Uh, and and these, where can we read or see these? YouTube. It, it's all on YouTube. Is it Tim T? Everything's on YouTube. Please. Is it T I M? M M. Two M's. T I M M. And I I got uh, Ian Sandberg. I didn't get the other one you mentioned. Um, Stephanie Hoplin and uh, Nigel Howard. Okay, Stephanie Hopklin. H-A-K-U-L-I-N. H-A-K-U-L-I-N. And Nigel... Howard. Howard, okay, I'm, yeah. I'm gonna go right Nigel and Stephanie are both, uh, are both interpreters. So they have interpreted poetry. Um, whereas Ian is a... Well, he's an actor, he's a poet, he's a writer, he's an artist. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm gonna take a look at those. Sure, sure. I mean, if those, um, those are the kinds of things that you're interested in. I am, um, I'm going to uh, wrap it up here, but I am so thrilled to have these students here uh, because Thank you for this, opening it up to them. That's yeah, awfully thoughtful I mean, this of you. Is That's wonderful. Really um, and good luck with all your studies. And I mean, you guys are going to be the future of uh, of all of this. So we're we're thrilled that you're keeping it going and have an interest in it. And I can't thank Reed enough. I mean, fabulous job. It added so much to the program. Uh, this is definitely something we will do again. So uh, I have your number. <laughs> okay. But I'm also, I'm also a little bit intrigued by the by your group in Manchester who do presentations because I would love to incorporate that in what we're doing. We we do dance, music, concerts, theater, we do everything. And um, this is this is kind of opening a whole door here. Uh, it would be wonderful to bring that to the Lake Sunapee region. So uh, so we'll chat. Great. Uh, in a few ways. Okay. And uh, thank you all for joining us. Have yeah. a great weekend, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Hey, four weeks and you guys are done. Oh, right, right, right. You actually mind if I ask one last question? Oh, sure. sure. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, in terms of like preparation and like the actual physically doing it, I just want to ask like with COVID and everything going online, has that uh, changed like your processes at all of doing business? Um, I'm not sure what you mean about the doing business. The business that I do, I, uh, I was probably one of the earlier folks to be vaccinated. So I still do a lot of work live and in person, um, which is of course my preference, right? Um, you know, because you know how sign language is so 
how much facial grammar is required to get the meaning out. And on a screen, I don't necessarily want you to see up my nose, but in order for you to get it, to get a real sense of it, you've gotta be that up close and personal. You know what I mean? So it's kind of hard, even with the technology as wonderful as it is, there is some loss of translation in the distance. You know what I mean? By doing business, I just meant with like the um, like booking a gig, the preparation for it, being in contact, wondering like, like being in, like the context of like what is it, what's going to be talked about, getting copies of the poems to read, or uh, find it, like if like I do my homework. I am a staunch advisor of do your homework because guess what? If you do not do your homework, you find yourself in the wrong place at the wrong time, and you have no way to get out. So do your homework because by and large, as interpreters, our protocol is do no harm. And if you did not do your homework and you find yourself in like a, you know, open heart surgery thing, oh my God, is that what that word was? You know, you, <laughs> you will find yourself in a very, very short string and in a scary situation. So I give myself as much homework doing time as I possibly can. And you're in college now, so you know what it's like to organize your time so that you can make sure you've got all your bases covered. I mean, that's critical critical in the success of your work. Organize your time and do your homework. Good and advice, Maddie. So one last question. So I know you, you did great doing this all on your own, by the way. Yeah. Um, so just out of curiosity, uh, how do you handle, since it was such a big event, like turn taking with everybody trying to like speak over each other? Oh, I when thought everybody was very well mannered. Everybody took turns. I think Jean handled that you know, she was like the Pride. ringmaster of the circus. She did great. But, but but by the same token, Jean's comes from that kind of environment. She knows what that's about. So she knows what's required to make that, you know, to hold all the flaming swords in the air at the same time. She knows what that looks like. Had it been uh, somebody who didn't know, then I would have to do, I would have to make that part of my homework. You know, everybody has to take turns. They have to raise their hand. Jean already had that over covered. She laid out the rules before everybody got in. So I know there were a few times where there were multiple people talking, but I was hoping it wouldn't get to that. So yeah, I mean, I can only I can only interpret what I can hear. Right. Yeah. So when that hole gets, uh -huh. you know, Jean very clearly said, "Okay, your turn. Now your turn." And what did you want to say? So, you know, that whole process can be done very effectively and efficiently if, in fact, everybody knows. They have to sort of stay in their lanes. Yeah, rules of the road. <laughs> right. Everybody stay in your yeah, lane. It should carry over to live events. I mean, this yeah. was on Zoom. It's probably, you can say, okay, everyone mute, you know. But when right. you have a live event, it's not as easy to, uh, you know, keep keep things organized, right? Turn yeah, taking. Be great. Any more questions, you guys? Uh, are, would we have availability to this recording at some point? Yes. This is actually still going. So it's on YouTube uh, for, for better or worse. <laughs> you, if you go to YouTube, you're gonna see the whole poetry event and then you're gonna see this uh, Q and A with the interpreter at the end. Um, and if you just want this portion for uh, your school or whatever, just fast forward to that that section. Um, I, I almost stopped recording and I thought, you know, this is kind of nice. And um, so I hope you don't mind that I, I continue the recording. Uh, it's nice to have it uh, be part of the program. All right. Yeah, it's, it's fine on my, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we're going to wrap it up, guys. Okay. Thank you Good so luck, everyone. much, everyone. All of you. And uh, I, I hope everyone stays in touch. I hope we see you all again soon. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.